In this lecture, we will discuss Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is sometimes also called ADD, or Attention Deficit Disorder, when there is less hyperactivity. So there are really a few different types of ADHD, and I want to discuss them with you. It's basically, in general, a, an impairment in functioning in at least two settings, usually home and school, due to in, in impulsivity, inattention, or hyperactivity. So let's discuss the three major types. We have the combined type, which is the most common. Patients with this problem have difficulty with attention and focus, and have some hyperactive or impulsive behavior. In the inattentive type, which is the second most common, they may have difficulty with attention, but there is no significant hyperactive or impulsive behaviors. And in the hyperactive impulsive type, which is less common, there's less problems with attention, and it's more common maybe in preschoolers, where they mostly have the hyperactive component. So there seems to be some genetic predisposition to this problem. Boys are much more likely than girls to get the problem. A child of a parent with ADHD has a 25% chance of developing ADHD themselves. Also, there is a 55 to 90% monozygotic twin concordance. In other words, there seems to be some strong genetics at work here. There are also some syndromes that are genetic that are predisposed to developing ADHD. Children with Kleinfelters, children with Turners, children with Fragile X, children with neurofibromatosis type 1 or Williams syndrome or even DeGeorge syndrome are at increased risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So there are also, however, environmental factors at work. Patients with lower socioeconomic status are more prone to the problem, as are par patients with parents who have mental disorders. Children in foster care are more likely to have ADHD. Children who were of low birth weight or prematurity are more likely to have ADHD, and children with acquired traumatic brain injury may develop ADHD. So ADHD may present differently depending on the age at which that child is being brought to attention. In the preschool era, hyperactivity is usually a larger component. These patients may be impulsive. They're not flexible with their environment. In other words, if something has significantly changed, they don't tolerate it very well. And they may be aggressive with their peers. In the elementary school era, these children now start to struggle with listening in class. They have poor organizational skills, they struggle with social interaction, and they may have difficulty functioning independently. And as adolescents, um, they have a problem with adult academic demands. As high school starts and these children have increased responsibility academically, they can really start to struggle. And they can start to struggle with attention, learning, and even executive functioning. When you see a patient with a potential attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's important to do a complete H&P and look for neurologic and genetic problems. So one issue is to rule out conditions with similar symptoms which may coexist with ADHD. Examples are anxiety disorders, depression. Patients with sleep disturbance may present very similar to ADHD. A good example is sleep apnea. These children look like they have ADHD. If they, for example, have their tonsils removed and look better, that resolves. Substance abuse. Patients with oppositional defiant disorder may not really have attention deficit issues. They might just be misbehaving. Patients with conduct disorders or patients with true learning disorders. Perhaps the patient is having problems reading because they have dyslexia, not because they have attention deficit problems. So there are some DSM-5 criteria for ADHD, which I think are useful to review. The DSM-5 states that six or more symptoms of inattention for children up to the age of 16, or five or more for adolescents 17 and older and adults, are needed to be able to establish the diagnosis. The symptoms of inattention need to have been present for at least six months, and they are inappropriate for developmental level. So let's go through the classic symptoms of attention deficit. 
Examples are often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, at work, or with other activities. Often has trouble holding attention on tasks or play activities. Often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace. In other words, loses focus or becomes sidetracked. Often has trouble organizing tasks and activities. Often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to do tasks that require mental effort over a long period of time, such as schoolwork or homework. Often loses things necessary for tasks and activities, such as school materials, pencils, books, etc. These patients may become easily distracted or forget daily activities. So those are the criteria for attention deficit. But what about the hyperactivity component? The DSM-5 states that for a diagnosis, patients require six or more symptoms of hyperactivity impulsivity for children up to age 16 or five or more for adolescents 17 or older and adults. The symptoms of hyperactivity impulsivity must have been present for at least six months, just like for the attention deficit symptoms. So let's go through the classic symptoms of hyperactivity often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in seat, often leaves seat in situations when remaining seated is expected, often runs about or climbs in situations where it is not appropriate, such as adolescents or adults may be limited to feeling restless. Also, they may be unable to play or take part in leisure activities quietly. They may be often on the go or acting as if driven by a motor. They may talk excessively. They may blurt out an answer before a question has been completed or have trouble waiting their turn. They may interrupt or intrude on others, for instance, butting into conversations or games.